What I wanted to do in this video is talk about man in the browser attacks, which are employed in a number of prominent malware families. Some of the families that employ man in the browser attacks or man in the browser techniques rather include examples like Gozi, Silent Banker, Zeus, SpyEye, and Carperp, among others. And in fact, we've seen a recent uptick of Carperp, so it's been really uh, prominent lately. And these examples, and, and this is maybe typical of a lot of man in the browser attacks. Uh, represent a category of malware that's known as uh, a, a banking trojan. And really, banking trojans are designed to perpetrate financial services fraud by effectively uh, co-opting or really changing transaction information between a victim and their financial institution. I do want to stress, though, that a typical man-in-the-browser technique is, in fact, much more generic. It's not just limited to use in the context of banking trojans. In fact, We've seen situations in which man-in-the-browser techniques are used in other forms of malware. For example, uh, we've seen them used in the context of uh, corporate espionage, so really stealing uh, data that might be of interest to an organization, uh, not just data that's maybe of interest to a consumer. So to begin with, I want to point out that a piece of malware that implements a man-in-the-browser attack can infect a system using any one of a number of very standard techniques. and We've talked about these techniques in some of the other videos, but just to kind of reiterate, uh, the, the standard techniques by which malware can get onto a system include things like uh, social engineering, in other words, tricking a user into uh, getting themselves infected. Uh, other examples include uh, exploitation of a technical vulnerability on the system. Uh, malware can also get onto a system uh, via a dropper. In this case, uh, if the system is already infected with a piece of malware, then that malware might in fact then bring other pieces of malware onto that same system. And again, these are all standard ways by which malware can get onto systems. There's nothing special about how a banking trojan will get onto a system. And so what I'm going to do in this video series on man in the browser attacks is focus not so much on how they get onto systems, but really focus on what these types of attacks entail once, they, once the corresponding trojan or corresponding piece of malware has actually infected the system in the first place. So with that, let's say we have a, a, a system and I'm put a, a box here to represent the system. And let's say this system uh, is infected with a piece of malware that implements a man in the browser attacks. So here's this piece of malware in red. And what's going to happen is the malware will really interfere with data that's passed between the user and their web browser. So let's say the user has a web browser they have open on their system. When the user interacts with their web browser, and let's mark the user here in orange. So here's the user. Uh, when the user interacts with their web browser, all the traffic is actually going to pass through the malware. So the malware effectively is going to co-opt the channel, the communications channel between the user and their browser. And this is happening all on the system itself. And in this capacity, what's really happening is the, the malware can effectively interfere with that data that's being passed between the user and their web browser. And by interfere, I mean that the data passed back and forth uh, can potentially be recorded, it can also be potentially modified as well. So what kinds of damage can be inflicted by piece of malware during such a, a man the browser attack? So to kind of highlight it, let me, let me talk about a few use cases. So the, the standard use case or the standard killer application for uh, these types of, of Trojans include things like, uh, like credential theft. And by credential theft, I mean uh, the theft of credentials that are used in the context of things like uh, logging into any system you have access to. So for example, passwords can be stolen uh, using these types of attacks. Uh, you can also steal things like two-factor authentication tokens, uh, usernames, and, and so on and so forth. Basically, anything you can imagine the user typing into a form on their web browser can then be stolen. Now, in addition to stealing credentials, these man-in-the-browser Trojans can also do things like steal, they can steal things like like screenshots. They can capture what's going on on the screen and pass that back. They can steal information about where the mouse was and when the mouse clicked on, on certain parts of the screen. And the reason that's actually interesting is that a lot of organizations, banks, and so on and so forth try to implement alternate mechanisms for allowing the user to input their credentials. So for example, you'll see banks that might have, instead of having a, a form box where you can type in your password, they may have a graphical display of a keyboard or a graphical display of a numeric keypad on the screen and then have you click on the corresponding characters of your password or your PIN and input your credentials in that way. 
And the idea is that if you can steal information about the location of the mouse, or if you can steal information about the contents of the screen itself, then you can effectively capture these other types of, of passwords that are maybe different ways of implementing those passwords. But I do want to stress, though, that these credentials, you know, they can be used for many purposes, not just banking, uh, not just for financial services, but you can imagine other situations, like, for example, stealing information related to a social networking account. Uh, you can imagine also for, for corporations that we and we've seen this happen quite frequently. Uh, you can imagine that you can see malware that will steal information about things like uh, your VPN password, or they can steal information about uh, VNC, which is a, a remote login capability. And this behavior really suggests, especially these last three cases, suggests that uh, corporate espionage is a very important uh, use case or application for uh, these types of session uh, trojans, these types of, of man of the browser attacks. Now, man of the browser attacks can also be used to modify details of transactions. And this is very important because it's not just about credential theft, but also about uh, modification. I'm going to actually put that first and such actually a much more, I think, prominent example because really credential theft can be done uh, using other mechanisms as well. But modification of transaction details is, is actually a quite a critical capability of these man in the browser Trojans. Uh, so to make that more concrete, let's say you have a, a victim and he's infected with a piece of, of malware that implements a man in the browser attack. Now what the man in the browser malware is going to do, it's going to basically silently wait until the victim, and let, let's call the victim Alice in this case, and, and uh, let's write that down. Let's say Alice is the victim. And let's say Alice is using her computer to conduct a transaction with her bank. So let's say she decides she will direct her browser to go to her bank's website. And let, let's say the bank is located at uh, bank.example.com. Okay, what the man in the browser Trojan is going to do, it's going to sit there silently. And then once it detects that Alice has logged into her bank and, and entered her password in and so on and so forth, and that's an active session going on with their bank, it's going to then start co-opting data on the channel between Alice and her web browser. So for example, let's say that Alice tries to initiate a transaction. Let's say it, let's say that Alice will is interested in using her bank's online bill pay to transfer money. Let's say she wants to transfer uh, $10 between her and Bob. So let's say Alice wants to transfer uh, $10 to some vendor, Bob, to whom she owes money. What the banking Trojan will do, what this, this uh, man of the browser attack is going to do under the hood is, is, and actually maybe we should take a step back and think about what happens under the hood during a typical transaction. So during a transaction, this transaction request of $10 going from Alice to Bob gets translated into a sequence of, of letters and numbers that represent the transaction. And that sequence of letters and numbers might correspond to what's known as an HTTP POST request. So let's say there's an HTTP POST request between Alice and her bank. And this request basically gets constructed on Alice's computer and then will be subsequently, so basically Alice enters in information. The information then results in a request being made and that request gets made uh, to Alice's bank. And let's, let's label the bank uh, here. And the bank will then carry out the request of Alice, assuming for example, Alice has the right amount of funds and, and so on in her account. All right. Now in this particular case, what's going to happen is the, the banking Trojan, the, the man in the browser attack is going to really modify the details of this transaction when it happens. These Trojans are capable, for example, of taking this $10 and instead of making it $10, they can make it, uh, I don't know, $100. So they'll replace the amount of the transaction. They can also replace the person to whom the transaction goes to. So imagine instead of going to Bob, the transaction will go to a malicious party and we'll call her Mallory. So really, even though Alice thinks that she has initiated a transaction of $10 between her and Bob, the banking Trojan under the hood has modified the details of that transaction to make it $100 to the, the attacker. Now, Alice doesn't realize this is happening. This is all happening underneath the hood. It's all surreptitious. Okay. And so as a result, uh, it, it's going to be almost, Alice will have no idea this is happening. Uh, 
Um, her bank, on the other hand, is going to get a different request than what Alice thought she put in. The bank's going to basically honor the request of $100 between Alice and Mallory because what's really happening is the banking Trojan, keep in mind, is, is able to wait until the user, in this case Alice, is actually logged into her account. Once Alice is logged in, then this, this man in the browser Trojan, this banking Trojan, will basically jump on top and start modifying details of that transaction. So what makes this particular attack so potent, so powerful, is that the, the malware really waits for the user to legitimately log into their account. All right, And so as a result, we often call uh, these banking Trojans or these, these man in the browser Trojans, we often call them session hijacking Trojans because they can essentially hijack a, a legitimate session and co-opt it and the attacker can basically take that session and use it for their own good. And actually, I did a separate video on session hijacking Trojans in the context of two-factor authentication. I would encourage you to watch that video if you want more details. Now, of course, a lot of banks, and I want to stress this, display transaction details and bank balances and other pieces of information along with the transaction back to the user. So for example, let's say Alice conducted this transaction. Um, she can then look at her bank balance after the transaction took place. So let's say she started off with $1,000 in her bank account. And after this transaction, you know, she would expect if she's transferring, let's say $10 to Bob, she would expect her bank balance to be uh, $990 afterwards. Now, on the other hand, let's say this, this banking Trojan was on the system and modified the transaction. Uh, the real balance at that point for Alice won't be $990. It'll actually be $900, right? And Alice might realize, hey, something is wrong. I only transferred $10 to Bob. Why is my bank balance just $900 now? So if she sees that, she may realize that something got in the way, something modified her transaction. She might be on to the idea that there is a banking Trojan of some sort or some malicious activity happening underneath the hood that she is not entirely aware of. All right. And it turns out that some of the more sophisticated man in the browser malware actually handles this case as well by employing a technique known as HTML rewriting. So in addition to doing modification and credential theft, these banking Trojans can also do what's known as HTML rewriting. And so this is a very powerful capability. What this means is that these banking Trojans, not only will they modify the details of the transaction, they are capable of then modifying what data is displayed in Alice's web browser. So what this banking Trojan will affect do is instead of having the correct bank balance, $900 displayed back to Alice, it'll modify what Alice sees on her browser and make it $990. So Alice thinks that she just made a $10 transaction to Bob. Her bank balance is $990. In the meanwhile, though, her bank has a different view of the world. From Alice's perspective, she has $990 in her account. But her bank actually thinks that Alice just has $900 in her account because her bank will have honored this transaction between Alice and Mallory, even though Alice thought she was transacting with Bob for a different amount of money. So really, this is a very powerful capability that exists within banking Trojans. And what I'm going to do is, is, is stop this video right here. In the next video, I'm going to talk a bit more about how these, these man in the browser attacks work underneath the hood.